evening. <coughs> First of all, welcome to the Royal Anthropological Institute and to this lecture of the Anglo Turkish Society. My name is David Shankar. For those who don't know me, I'm the director of the Institute, but also have the much greater privilege of being the chairman of the Anglo Turkish Society. So I'd like to welcome you here, His Excellency, as well. It's very kind of you to join us today. And we're going to listen to an archaeological seminar on, on, on Turkey. And people here will know, I'm sure, that the, one of the absolute greatest successes of the, of the public is the way that it managed to preserve, expand, enhance, and make world famous its archaeological treasures. And I think what we're going to hear tonight is just yet another example of this quite extraordinary uh, success which other nations really should emulate. Mm -hmm. But uh, this evening, uh, Lee Clare will be, will be talking to us, and as you will have seen, he's a research lecturer in the Orient Department of the German Archaeological Institute, and at the same time, he's the coordinator of research in fieldwork at the Beckett, and enjoying now an international reputation for traveling the world and giving lectures about this extraordinarily important excavation. So we'd like to welcome you uh, to join us. And note on the proceedings. What we'll do is we'll have an hour of a lecture, then questions, and then if those of you are on the folding chairs could please uh, stand up and get them out of the way, then we can have a glass of wine. But unless we get rid of the folding chairs, we won't have anything to drink. <laughs> so there we go. That's that. Please, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much okay. for the invitation to speak this evening. Um, it's true, I have been on my travels. Uh, I just came back from uh, Shannon uh, yesterday. Uh, saw planes and came uh, to London. Um, you realise, of course, we're now in more or less in the first sort of three months or so of the Gebeki uh, year, which is 2019. Um, and for this reason, of course, a lot of uh, work is being done uh, in the media, um, and of course, what I'm doing my share as well, um, getting the message across uh, what an important site we have and how lucky we are to have this site uh, in southeastern Turkey. So, um, yeah, I'm going to speak tonight uh, about the site. Um, I think perhaps some of you have heard a lecture by Klaus Schmidt before he passed away, um, the old excavation director. He passed away in 2014. And uh, I took over the reins um, uh, when he passed away. And uh, uh, actually, it was um, provisional. I wasn't expecting to be here now. Um, it was like, oh, you know, a couple of years or a year or so until we find a new, uh, a new Hodger, a new professor. And uh, he didn't arrive, or she didn't arrive. So um, I sort of slipped into this sort of function, and uh, five years later, here I stand. So I'm, I'm very, very fortunate in, in a way, um, especially working at this site. Um, really, one of the most, uh, if Ian were here, he'd probably say not the most spectacular. I'm sure he'd say Chateau Vieux is a lot more spectacular. Um, but I think, uh, at least for the so called pre pottery Neolithic, the earliest Neolithic, uh, one of the most uh, important sites uh, currently under investigation. Um, of course, here on the left-hand side, I mean, I have a lot of people to thank. It's not just me standing here, there are many, many people behind this. And of course, also our, our, um, our very close cooperation with the Museum of Shannon Open, the uh, Ministry of Culture, of course, in Ankara, um, with whom we work very uh, well together. And of course, the excavations are a joint uh, collaboration in that sense. But I'll tell you a bit more about the uh, organization of the, of the project a little later on. Um, Okay, let's see if this works. So I'm going to give you a general introduction to the site, and also um, you'll probably realise as I go along that a lot of the previous sort of conclusions about the site reached by Klaus Schmidt uh, were actually questioning that. Um, these are things that uh, you know have been put out there um, over the course of the past 25 years of, or 20 years of research when Klaus was uh, you know at the helm, um, and of course. Those really important things have been uh, what you can see here. Um, the site being declared the, the place where, the, where religion was born, um, and of course the world's first temples. Now, I'm going to tell you this evening that I don't believe they were the world's first temples. I don't believe in this temple uh, hypothesis. Um, I would prefer to you know, refer to them as multifunctional buildings, but we're going to that. Um, and also regarding the, the architecture, um, there are whole new uh, insights that we've you know, gotten in the past, over the course of the past two or three years, which really need to be put out there. Of course, we're doing that in the form of publications, um, which are a bit slower in coming, but uh, you, know, you have me here, so I'm going to give you the, the update uh, of our research at the site. 
So what is the site of Islamic Temple? I mean, we actually refer to it now as the uh, earliest human-made megalithic buildings worldwide. And that's exactly how ICOMOS and UNESCO saw it when we got our inscription in 2018, last July. Um, we actually, or the first draft of that uh, nomination actually said the world's first temples. And of course, you know, I was a bit concerned about this. I was involved with the, with the writing of the nomination. And I always said, I don't know about this. It's perhaps a little, you know, we should change that. And I spoke to many people, also from ICOMOS, and uh, we actually then decided actually to put forward the site, not as a site of the world's first temples, but as a site of the earliest human-made megalithic buildings. And that's uh, exactly what it is. That does say, uh, more details in just a second. Really, I mean, you probably know the answer to this question, but I think it's very important, and this is something that happens very rarely uh, with Quebec and is that it's put in its context. For us archaeologists, context is everything. You know, uh, the chronological context, the cultural context. There are all things that we have to really consider when looking at a site or even a find. A single find needs that context. Without its context, a find is not worthless, but it has less information for us. So, um, looking at Quebec Tepe and the role it's been given in the past 20 odd years um, of it being, you know, the, the birthplace of religion, you know, really we need to look at the context to really tell whether that is the case or not. So the Neolithic, as you probably know, this is not working now. Oh, here we go. Uh, really was not, it's often been referred to as the Neolithic Revolution. I mean, that would be very wrong in that sense. Revolution is quite a fast process. Um, but, you know, looking at the, the, uh, the so-called Neolithization uh, process, as we now know it from, from recent years, this was a very long, drawn-out process, one that covered really thousands of years. I mean, uh, what are the most important innovations of, which are attributed to neolithization? They are, of course, sedentism, which actually begins much earlier, you know, in the late past, <coughs> um, you know, around 13,000 BC in the southern Levant, we have good you know, uh, data for that. Uh, even earlier, in fact, in the other part of it, we have sedentary camps, or semi-sedentary camps. Domestic plants and animals come in about 8,000 to 8,200 BC, and of course, right at the very end of that, we have a 7,000 BC mark, the first pottery. That's why this very first part of the Neolithic, so here's the end of the Epipaleolithic, this timeline will be uh, under all the slides. Um, so really the, the early um, the Neolithic is sort of starts around 9600 BC, which coincides with the climate change, so called early Holocene, temperatures increase and, and the conditions improve. Um, then we have the so-called pre-pottery Neolithic, um, which is divided into various stages, mainly A and, and B, with early, middle and late. And of course, the pottery unit right at the end. And Gubekli Tepe fits right at the beginning of that sequence. So we're at the, the so called pre pottery unit A, which starts around 9,600. Um, and uh, the site itself goes to about 8,000 BC. Well, the radiocarbon data are not quite clear on that, but um, we have other, other you know, lines of evidence we can look at uh, regarding the. But it's about 1,500 years occupation, which is a very long time. You know, that's, if we think about it now, it's uh, from now right back to the end of the Roman period. So it's a 1,500 year period where so much was happening at the site. And there was a time where we had this transition, um, this slow transition from really uh, hunter-gatherers um, to farming communities. Um, so perhaps importantly, the, the uh, introduction of domesticated plants and animals actually comes in after Gobekli Tepe is abandoned. So this is uh, quite significant, in fact. You know, um, we have here the last hunter gatherers. Quebec Tepe is abandoned, and we have first uh, sites in the region where we have good, where we have uh, uh, data um, for domestic plants and animals, and it could, you know, have uh, be linked. <clears throat> okay, here you can see a, a, a rough map of, of uh, all of these early Neolithic sites. Um, we have a few late Epipaleolithic sites, which date to this you know, pre uh, Neolithic. And we have the PKA sites, and uh, the blue dots are where both uh, late PKA, uh, late Epipaleolithic and early, pottery, early uh, Neolithic sites. So you can see here this, uh, the Fertile Crescent is quite. Do you have a point on So we have this way of sites, the so called you know, um, Fertile Crescent. And of course, you can see a whole cluster of sites up in the north, uh, in what's now southeastern Turkey, uh, northern Syria, and northern Iraq. Um, and of course, Gebekli uh, Tepe is right in the center of this, uh, this cluster. Um, and of course, this northern cluster, this upper Mesopotamian cluster, is one of the key areas, one of the core areas where we have 
early Neolithic communities uh, farming. Uh, it's here that we have very early evidence for domestic plants and animals post Gebeki Tepe. So, um, a very important area indeed. And meanwhile, we have another area over in central Anatolia, which is another area of neolithization. Uh, I don't know whether Ian spoke about it last time when he was here, um, but we have um, uh, sites like Bonjuklu, for example, where we have also uh, indications that, uh, that they were actually also um, had their own neolithization processes going on in that region as well, with their own domestication of plants and animals. <clears throat> and of course, a prerequisite for uh, a site, to, you know, for the neolithization, for the domestication of animals and plants, is of course where they have the wild predecessors. And of course, in the case of the Upper Mesopotamian area, that is given. We have the wild crops, which are all there, and of course, also many of the animals, um, which you can see on the next slide. So we have, you know, sheep, uh, goat, and, and pig are the most important when it, you know, when it actually happens, as of the early DPMB. So. Um, what I want to show here and emphasize here is that Gebeki Tepe is at a very early stage of this Neolithic transition, right at the end of the Paleolithic, um, between sort of first sedentary communities coming in and the domestication of animals. And of course, after that, it all spread, of course. You know, we have here, bottom right, we have the, the core areas where the Neolithic really took place. And of course, if we look in westwards, it was not eastwards, etc. Uh, perhaps we should uh, take that off. Um, I think it's trying to download an update. Which you um, so it spread out uh, across central, across the Balkans, Central Europe, and reaching uh, <coughs> this, that's okay, this region, uh, you know, the British Isles, quite a bit later in the, in the fourth millennium. Okay, let's get to the site itself, uh, because of course the, the location is, is is all important. So here we are, it's a very impressive site. Uh, the location is, is uh, really unique. Uh, it's on one of the, I think it's the second, uh, often it was you know, written uh, by Klaus that it was on the highest point of the uh, Gernmusch uh, mountain range. In fact, it's the second highest point, as we now know, uh, from our geographers who have been working in the, in the uh, project for the past three years. Uh, so the second highest point of this mountain range. Um, so do we have a stick or something like that? No, I don't have a it's okay, I'll, I'll manage. So, um, we can see here the, the green area, this is the, the Haram plain. Yeah, that might be a bit Oh, it might be a bit So the, the black star is in the site, and then uh, we have here, of course, the Haram plain. And on three sides, we've got the mountain chain, so here in the north is the Gamash range, we have the Tek Tek on the eastern side, and Shanghuk is here in, in the northwestern corner of the plain, and we have a, a line of mountains coming or hills coming down here. Um, and of course, from the site itself, there are fantastic views on, on a good day when it's not so, uh, you know, especially in the spring and in, in the autumn. These are taken in the spring. So to the north, we have the, the, the eastern Taurus Mountains, and on the horizon, you can also see uh, Nemud, Nemudda, another UNESCO heritage site. You can actually see from the uh, from our site. Um, uh, I was there say, just a few days ago and, and uh, there was still snow on the mountains, it's wonderful view. Uh, to the east we have the Karajida mountain, uh, it's an old volcanic massif and uh, this is one of the areas, or there were studies done in the 1990s um, on uh, einkorn wheat and they actually discovered or, or uh, determined that this area here, the, the, the flanks of the Karajida mountain, is where the first einkorn wheat was actually domesticated. And then to the south, we have the Haram Plain stretching down in front of us. On good days, with good visibility, you know, we can see 30, 40 kilometers, uh, more or less to the Syrian border. So it's a very, very important location. It's visible from the plain when you look up. And of course, um, for the people that lived here, and I say lived here, that's another thing we're going to come to, because of course Klaus said it was a purely ritual site with no domestic activity. We know different. Um, <laughs> uh, the, people, the hunters were living here, of course, they need to keep you know, track of what was going on down in the plain. Of course, this is a perfect location for keeping track of those gazelle herds, which are you know, moving around uh, the site uh, and through the, the, the plains, surrounding plains. So a very strategic point, um, perhaps even for defense purposes. Um, so um, that would, would really uh, uh, explain the choice uh, of, of this location. Yeah, as you know, 2018, we became World Heritage. Um, but I, I put this picture down here as well because this shows the site before 
um, the excavations commenced and the area we were the site. Um, Company fields, it was, uh, it was being farmed by the uh, local villagers from Urengic, um, who are now uh, very much engaged as our workmen and also at the new uh, information centre. And they're the bus drivers and they do more or less their guards. And uh, mm -hmm. so a very strong link to the local community, which we're very, very proud of. Um, and of course, they have a very special bond to this land that they still see themselves as, you know, as being part of this landscape. Um, so it was being farmed, and of course, you know, this was. In the, this was this farming activity was of course bringing stuff to the surface and this was being reported to the museum. Um, but the site itself was actually discovered officially, say officially, by archaeologists in the 1960s. In 1963, there was a, a joint survey project undertaken by the University of Istanbul and Chicago, um, and they were actually going around the whole southeastern Turkish or southeastern regions uh, looking for new archaeological sites. And they came across the Becky Depot. It was, it was noted down, it's published um, uh, as, a, you know, as a result of this survey work. But then nothing more happened. They went away, and, and large pieces of limestone, which they were you know, observed on the surface, they were thought to be much later. Um, of course, no one knew about Tipidus then, so you know, it's not their fault. Um, and uh, what happened then was uh, the archaeologists went away, and they chose another site to excavate, they went to Chalinid, which is another uh, important Neolithic site. Um, further to the east near uh, Diabaka. Um, and it wasn't until 1995 the archaeological excavations then took off. Um, of course, this was following excavations by Hauptmann Bay, by Harald Hauptmann, um, at Nevalichori, a uh, particular site, um, which he excavated in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and Klaus Schmidt was working there as well with him. So by then, you know, they knew about tea pillars. They knew about the Nilotik, they knew about tea pillars, uh, about these monumental type buildings. Um, although, as we now know, they were much later at the Valley Choi. Um, and they came, and Klaus came, apparently, I mean, this is all sort of, it's a bit of a myth now how it happened. I mean, apparently Klaus came and, and saw what is going on, and saw the things on the surface, and there were the farmer sort of with a sledgehammer hacking at a, at a teeper. Um, I, I don't know how true all these stories are, but they're very romantic, and I, I like the idea of it. Um, but uh, this is apparently how it happened. And in the mid-1990s, 1995, Excavation started uh, with a, a cooperation between the German Archaeological Institute uh, with Harald Helpmann, um, who was then director of the institute in Istanbul, and, um, and Klaus Schmidt was the, uh, was the uh, field director. Here again, uh, another aerial view was taken a few years ago before the new shelters were constructed. You can see here on the right hand side the so called main excavation area. Um, and then you have this line of trenches on the, on the southwest mound. So east is that way, west is this way. Um, and then the northwest area as well, which, uh, where excavation started around 2009, 2010. But what you can't see very well here, but you know, I have to point out because I haven't got a picture where you can actually see it very well, is that the mound is not sort of perfectly symmetrical, but it's a sequence of sort of hollows and, and mounds. So we have a, a mound here, this is a southwest mound. The main excavation area is in a dip uh, in a hollow, um, the, the southeast hollow, I call it. Um, Klaus always called it the southeast depression, but I don't like this depression. Uh, I, I prefer it's a you know, more positive sort of hollow. Um, then we have uh, another mound uh, where the metal roof is, and then another dip, and then we have another ridge, and this is a northwest uh, depression or northwest hollow with another mound or knoll here. So it's really a sequence of, of mounds and, uh, uh, and, and dips, and uh, in these dips, uh, for example, in the main excavation area, this is where Klaus Schmidt found these, these mo monumental round uh, in, uh, buildings. Um, and on the higher lying parts, he found rectangular buildings. Um, and for him, this was quite clear, and we knew this from other sites already, or he knew that, um, that the round buildings were very characteristic of the PPNA. We have round architecture at this time. And around the early PPNB, we have this transition to rectangular buildings. So around sort of 8700 BC, the people, these communities, discovered the corner. This was another innovation of <laughs> in the new Olympic. So uh, the corner was discovered in 8,700. They started building sort of rectangular houses. Um, so it was a chronological sort of differentiation based on the, on the um, architecture. And he wanted to test. When he went over to this area in 2009, he uh, had excavations in, in, the, in the hollow, in the dip, and on the mound to test his hypothesis that he you know, discovered down here that in the dip was the round and on the hill was the rectangle. And that was, he confirmed that. So this is where he found building H. 
and up here there were rectangular buildings which were then for him PKMB, early PKMB. This is how the site looks today. A few snapshots that uh, I brought with us with me. Uh, these are the new uh, shelters uh, at the site. Um, the top one here, this is over the main excavation area, so the southeastern hollow. Um, you can see it's a, well, I always refer to it as a Pringle, sort of a Pringle shape, <laughs> um, with, a, with a wooden walk, walkway underneath. Um, the wooden walkway you can see there has now been removed. This is the old part of the, of the of Klaus's uh, construction. Um, where this is used to go across, that's now been removed. So the whole of the, of the area is now free. You can walk all the way around and see the site from every perspective, which is uh, uh, a very good thing for the, for the visitors. So presentation is obviously a very a key uh, issue for us now. Um, and this one at the bottom, this is uh, a design. This is over the northwestern part of the mound. We have the northwest hollow where building H is. Um, you can see here uh, it's a different design, but actually it's not designed for the public yet. Um, there are wishes uh, uh, to extend the, the you know, visitor path to include this area, but at the moment excavations aren't that advanced that we think it's worthwhile. Um, so I think for the meantime we'll stay in this area and we'll do more excavations under here. I mean, this is actually to provide us with laboratory conditions so we can do those excavations because, of course, when you're here um, in <coughs> September uh, or May, June, um, we're not there in the summer, um, it still gets very, very hot and we need shade. There's no shade. Um, you know, it's, it's a very hard uh, job uh, excavating uh, at the site. Um, so uh, this is providing us with the much needed uh, shade uh, and laboratory conditions we need uh, to take photographs and do the documentation that we need. So they have an impression of, of what it's like for us working there. Um, of course, we're having so many visitors now to the site uh, since the UNESCO nomination. Um, you know, it's increased dramatically. Um, not just at Gobekli Tepe, but also in the city of Shannon. Also, you can see the coaches coming. Um, I was there, as I say, just a few days ago, um, and the site was full. I mean, the, the car parks built, um, uh, the entrance to the site uh, are no longer you know, they're, they're too small. We have coaches coming, tens of coaches every weekend, um, cars, uh, and, and uh, you know, it's a constant flow of, of visitors, which we're very pleased about. And, and the city is very happy, of course, because of course, after the, after the last few years of, of, of political problems in, in southeastern Turkey with the, you know, the Syrian conflict, uh, things are picking up again, and uh, I'm very happy that they could make a contribution to that. So, um, uh, a positive, development for the local economy as well. But anyway, for us archaeologists working at the site, here we are, so my, uh, my two colleagues working in Building D, which I'll show you in a few moments. Uh, and of course we have always the, the onlookers uh, asking us either questions or actually telling us to move out of the way for their photographs, which I don't think very kindly to. <laughs> I mean, it would have be nice to take photographs of archaeologists working, but no, I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, to the organisation, uh, this is very important, of course, because uh, as I say, I'm not alone in, in this sort of uh, uh, this, this, uh, project. Um, the project itself, uh, is, at the moment that we're, uh, we're in, um, is uh, financed by the German Research Foundation, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, um, and it's entitled the Prehistoric Societies of Upper Mesopotamia and their Subsistence. Um, of course, we're here in the middle. This is the uh, Orient Department at the German Archaeological Institute. Um, this will soon be moving to Istanbul. Uh, as of uh, this year, I'll be uh, uh, based in Istanbul um, with, with the project. Uh, Professor Eichmann was, is the director of the Orient Department in Berlin. And our two main uh, collaborators in, in this project are uh, the uh, Ludwig Maximilian, Maximilian uh, Universität in München, in Munich. Um, Joris Peters is looking at the animal fauna with his colleagues. And of course, uh, for the past three years, we've been very happy and very lucky to have the Freie Universität Berlin uh, with us doing landscape geography and uh, landscape archaeology, which is so important for us because so far we have no sort of climate proxies for the region. I mean, it's very important. We want to know what the climate was like at the time of the, of the, of the site, you know, 11,000 years ago. We want to know, uh, you know, whether there was erosion and, and all of these things, environmental factors. We have very little, you know, information about that. The nearest climate proxies we have are at sites perhaps in, in central Anatolia, the lakes, Lake Van, uh, or in the northern Levant. So we need some more local proxies to reconstruct uh, the prehistoric climate 
uh, and both the Vicky Tepe, and also the diachronic uh, sort of development of that uh, environment over the past you know, 11, 12,000 years. Of course, we're very uh, grateful to the, to the Ministry of Culture and Tourism in Ankara that we are allowed to excavate there, obviously. And you know, we, we're working together with the Shannon Open Museum, Jalalbe. Jalal Uda is our Kazabashkan uh, excavation director. Uh, we have support from a scientific advisory board, um, including the very prominent colleagues, Namit Ozduan, Nejmi Karol, and, uh, and Gurdjieff Kosby. Um, of course, a very important uh, element or factor for us is heritage and site management, because of course, when you have a site like the Becky Depot that is a World Heritage Site, UNESCO site, we have to take care of the heritage and the site itself, and of course, the tourism. Um, so we're working together there also with the museum and with the Shannon Water Regional Council for conservation of cultural properties and site management. So it's a very big undertaking. You know, what we're doing now is, is sort of, we have to not just answer our academic questions, we have the responsibility to protect the site and the heritage and also to make it accessible to the public. So any work we do at the site, excavation-wise, we're trying to fulfill these three criteria. Um, so as I say, academic uh, questions, um, the, the presentation um, and the conservation. This is then the research team, now getting into the nitty gritty of it, you know, uh, who does what, we don't we need to go into detail here, um, but of course we have natural sciences involved, we have anthropologists looking at the human remains, we have archaeobotanists, we have uh, archaeofauna, of course the animal bones, landscape archaeology and radiocarbon dating. Um, we have, of course, the so-called small finds. We have people looking at the, the finds uh, recovered from the site, which include masses and masses of flint artifacts. But they make up, I think, the majority, well, yeah, the majority of finds. I mean, the, 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 the mound itself is full of flint, chipped flint, worked flint artifacts produced uh, over the course of 1,500 years of human occupation at the site. We have grinding stones, so the, the people living at the site living, I'm saying again, uh, living at the site um, were actually uh, grinding uh, wild crops, not yet domesticated obviously, um, that came later, but they were using them um, quite intensively. Um, we have obsidian, very few obsidian artifacts, but we have connections here to the, you know, the obsidian sources, not only in Cappadocia, but also in eastern Anatolia. Um, we have personal, we have many bees, for example here at the bottom, you can see bee production, made on very small uh, bird bones and stone. Um, we have various other things like scepters, pestles, stone vessels. We have the so-called shaft straighteners, which are sort of stone objects like this with a groove in, which it's said that they were used to straighten the wooden shafts of arrow, for arrows. So those are being looked at. And of course, there are other things, archaeological features. The building archaeology is a mainstay, of course, the, the, the architecture uh, we can learn so much from. Um, we have spatial studies within that architecture, uh, and of course, the stratigraphy. Um, which for any archaeological site is the, you know, uh, essential, you know, how the site was formed and uh, uh, the, gen the genesis uh, of, of the site, as it were. So, so far, um, we've got quite a few buildings uh, excavated, the monumental buildings, um, uh, and there are about eight, or uh, there are eight, um, and these are labelled A to H in the order of their discovery. So you can see building A was first discovered in 1995-96, that was the first excavation by Klaus. And the last one he discovered was in 2010, which is building H. Building E drops out here a bit because that was named a bit later because they didn't actually realize or class didn't realize it was uh, a, one of these monumental buildings until he discovered C and D, which I'm going to go into that in, in a moment. So here on the left hand side is, uh, it's not very clear, it's a very small, but it's a stone map of the main, or a map of the excavation area, the main excavation area. So you can see here, here is building A, B, C, and D. And another thing we can point out here that's most important is that uh, none of these buildings has been excavated entirely. All of them are partially excavated. This is why we have so much work left to do. Um, Klaus obviously did a very good job. He has uncovered all of this, etc. But the things have not been excavated in their entirety. B is still half full uh, with sediment, as is A. At the bottom, the, 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 the floor of A hasn't yet been reached. Uh, C has, but there is still much to, to, to excavate around about, and the same applies to D, for example, and, and the others as well. So it's very much work in progress. So uh, this is a, an old uh, sort of reconstruction uh, of uh, the site made by uh, National Geographic some years back, which uh, I like to show because it gives uh, a good overview of the main characteristics of these monumental buildings. But it's wrong. 
Um, the, the characteristics are right, but the, uh, uh, the reconstruction, I've got a better reconstruction which I'm going to show at the end of the lecture, which will sort of summarize all the things I'm going to say to you um, over the next, I don't know how much time I have left, but uh, over the next half an hour or so. So, one of the main characteristics, there are six of them. The first, of course, is a round over ground plan, which is quite evident here. That, that building is C and this one is D. Um, we have two large central T-pillars in the center of the buildings, um, larger than the others. They can reach heights of five and a half meters. These pillars uh, are one piece of stone. So five and a half meters, they're about this thick, uh, and five and a half meters tall, um, and very, very impressive. We'll, I'll show another uh, slide in a second. We have, in the case of building C, we have up to three enclosing stone walls. Um, it's often, it was often written in the past that these um, uh, buildings were very short-lived. But now we know from uh, building archaeological studies and also from radio carbon data, these buildings were actually very long-lived. And these three walls are in fact different phases of this building. And this is quite interesting because what happened uh, it's quite common. It was also uh, seen at Nevada Choi, uh, uh excavation, and also here. Uh, the outer wall is actually the oldest phase of this building. And then what happened is they built a small building inside of that one, and then inside of that a smaller one. So it's like these Russian dolls. Yeah. So with each wall or with each phase, the building got smaller um, for whatever reasons. Um, and then we have, of course, an internal stone bench which runs around. You can just see it. Um, here, so it looks like the pillars are actually inserted into this stone bench. The pillars, apart from the two central pillars, the pillars are never freestanding. It's not like Stonehenge where you have this sort of freestanding circle of stones. These are buildings. Um, and, and the walls were there first and the T pillars were slotted in afterwards. Um, and apart from the two central pillars which are inserted into pedestals which are carefully carved in the case of C and D from the natural bedrock. So what you can see here, the floor of C and D is the, 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 the floor, the, the actual the, the, the rock surface, the limestone rock surface, which has been carefully smoothed, painstakingly smoothed, and then these uh, pedestals cut out, a slot put in, and the tea pillars inserted in the case of the central pillars. And of course, it's very, very, uh, when you're there and you see it, the, the foundations of these pedestals, these slots, it's like 15, cent, 6 inches, 15 centimeters. Um, so they would never have stood on their own. This is one of the indications, one of the reasons we think these buildings carry a roof. Yes. <laughs> to keep the weight on, to stop them from falling over. And of course, another indication is the, the pillars in the walls. If you look at them, they're all plus minus 15 centimeters, six inches, the same level, which would actually sort of speak in favor of, of a wall as well. So I mean, about a roof as well. So there are many uh, other sort of building archaeological sort of indicators where we say they, they uh, speak in favor of, of these buildings being, having been roofed. And then, of course, we have point six. The intentional backfilling of the building was at the end of their use lives. A ritual act. The buildings died and they were buried. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes and no. I mean, uh, when you see these buildings, building C is 30 meters in diameter. Um, and, you know, to fill a building like that, it's going to take a lot of stuff, a lot of rubble, which it is. It's rubble, it's this size rubble, limestone rubble, um, little bit flint artifacts, grinding stones, bits and pieces, bits of bone, and lots of animal bone. Um, and uh, Klaus Schmidt always said, yeah, this is uh, ritual backfilling. The buildings were buried after their use lives. There was feasting going on, to explain that as, as, you know, as an explanation for all the animal bones. But now we're beginning to think, you know, perhaps we should reconsider this. Because if you look at the, at the topography of the site, and I showed you the dips, and, the, and you know, we're in a dip here, and we have surrounding higher parts of the mound. What we're seeing probably here is erosion. Buildings collapsing in and filling up. Um, but I'll, I'll show you some uh, more slides in a second. So we're questioning a lot of the uh, earlier interpretations. And it's not in, you know, we're not being disrespectful to the class. I mean, he did uh, his, you know, based on what he saw. But of course, we're now. Uh, having a fresh look at that evidence. We have new evidence from new building archaeological studies. We have new radiocarbon dates, which you didn't have. Um, and so it's changing the picture of the site and, of course, also its function. So here's the shelter again. And this is some of the most recent work we've done at the site over the past, say, since 2014, uh, 14, 15, 16, into 17. It was like in the four sort of in, in the pre prelude to the construction of the of these shelters, of course, these shelters need foundations and these foundations have to be you know, 
drilled into the, into the bedrock, which meant at different locations uh, around the main excavation area, also the northwestern part, we had to do deep soundings, go through all the archaeology down right, because of course they couldn't drill, the builders couldn't drill through archaeology, that's important, yeah. we couldn't allow that. So we had to excavate these deep soundings so they could drill the foundations for these shelters. And so the first time we got really glimpses into the complete stratigraphy in very small areas, like keyhole surgery, very small areas that stratigraphy right through the mound, right down to the, to the limestone plateau beneath. Um, and this gave us insights into the earliest layers of the mound, it gave us insights into the genesis, into the, the, the morphology of the mound, uh, and it obviously gave us information about the levels of the, of the plateau as well underneath. Because of course previously, um, it was, it's been written that the, the mound is 300 meters in diameter and 15 meters high, and it's all archaeology. Now we know that, that this, this wasn't the case because what we think now, based on the measurements of the plateau at these different drill locations, uh, we can say, see and say that the thing was stepped. The plateau is not flat, it is stepped, so it's not all archaeology. So, um, you know, perhaps there's three meters of archaeology, four meters, five meters, but it's definitely not 15 at the top. Um, so this would be the case, I mean, this, this stepped uh, sort of formation of, of uh, the limestone, this could be natural, which it is, you look around the, the uh, surrounding hills, you can see the stepped sort of natural limestone, but it also could be the uh, sort of result of quarrying, because of course they were quarrying for these pillars um, and for the building material, and uh, they could have actually made these steps artificially, uh, a probably a mixture of both in fact. And you can see the quarrying going on here at the bottom. These are, um, are reconstructions uh, by our building archaeologist, Maurice Finson. Um, so you can see he's put in, uh, they're smoothing here the floor of the, of the monumental building. They've got the, the T pillars being carved here, um, so making sort of these, these artificial steps. And these steps are then used to uh, support the walls of the buildings. So they're sort of semi subterranean in a way. Um, uh, although, you know, Perhaps to the front they were less so, but uh, of course that also built up the sediment so over the course of time. <clears throat> and of course, elsewhere uh, we have coin activity as well. The mound is at the bottom at the top there, you can see the distance, about you know, three, four hundred meters away. But there's evidence in the surrounding uh, plateau for lots of coin activity, prehistoric coin activity. So if you walk around, you can see two or three. This was the most impressive one. This is a T pillar. It would have been the largest T pillar had it been actually sort of dragged away and erected. Um, it's, I think, about six meters, um, and it's actually been carved. You can see here, this area is all quarried away as well, so it's been taken away already. But this one was carved, and for some reason, they left it. There's actually been cracking it with that sort of post neolithic or whether this was a reason they left it because it broke when they were quarrying it. Um, but you can see they would have carved here channels, and they would have sort of used probably wooden levers to sort of split the limestone, and they would have dragged the thing away. So, um, and of course, this was a no, you know, this is quite a, a mean undertaking. undertaking. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we have pouring activities. This is a result from uh, the uh, geo radar uh, studies, um, which were a few years back in 2013. This was done by Klaus Schmidt, and uh, uh, he, he uh, had many of the areas. Uh, surveyed using this sort of ground penetrating radar where you don't have to excavate, obviously, you can send sort of, you know, uh, the, the, uh, actually, I'm not an expert for this, but of course, they have the technology uh, to do that, the colleagues. And uh, we get these anom anomalies come out, uh, which you can see here. Um, so here's the excavation area, the main excavation area, the southwest mound. And of course, you can see these rather large circular structures here, um, which haven't been excavated yet, apart from up here in the northwest area. Um, then we have building H, but actually building H doesn't, actually, doesn't really sort of correspond to the anomaly that we see in this picture. So we're a little bit sort of sceptical. Um, we really need to have more uh, excavation to see that, to see if what we're seeing here in the, in the geo radar is correct. But if we do take these as being these anomalies as being buildings, uh, especially this one in the centre, I mean building C over here, uh, you know, this is 30 metres in diameter. And if you compare it to that, if that is a building, it's going to be 60 meters. So this is a very large structure, if it is one. Um, it will be a very large building. So this is why we're very skeptical, very wary at the moment until we've actually done some excavations there. But it's not likely we'll be doing excavations in that area uh, just yet, because as I say, most of the, or all of the buildings down there um, have not been excavated in their entirety, and we have to sort those out first, I think, before we turn to a new building. 
I've got now a, a video sequence. It's made of scan data. Um, it's a, the resolution is very good, but it gives you an impression of the site. So this is the main excavation area. We're going to dive down here and go across here. Building A is here, C is here, and D is here. We're going to take a flight through building C and then onto building D. And I hope it works. Please, no. I actually need to press the, uh, the key, the button. Should I just uh, here we go. Oh. So here we go. Sorry. So we're flying down. So here's the entrance to the site. Here's A. Up here is C, and over there is D. So first we're going into C. You can see the two central pillars are not preserved. We have the circular building here we have inside, we have this bench that I was talking about, can you see, mm -hmm. with the pillars inserted into the bench. Mm -hmm. um, we have, this is one of the central pillars, it's sitting in a car pedestal, uh, we're sort of moving around here, there's the other one, in, there's the pedestal again that it's uh, been put into. And I'm going to zoom out and head over to D. This was taken, this was made a few years back, so the uh, excavations in D have progressed since this uh, video was made. But here we have again the round over ground plan, the two central teepers in the centre of the, of the building, not quite uh, completely excavated yet, but that, that happened uh, a year or so after this was taken. And of course, these also a bit higher than C because of the step situation of the, of the site. Okay. This is another recent shot. Um, so, if they weren't temples, mm -hmm. What were they? <laughs> um, yeah, but this is going to take a while. No, it's not. Um, so, uh, what was happening at this time? Of course, when people become sedentary, and people were sedentary at this time, we have sedentary villages, um, and we know quite a few of them in the region. These are all sites, domestic sites, known from southeastern Turkey, Tigris region, mainly, and also northern Syria. Um, and what I did here, a very basic sort of thing, I looked. Um, there was a previous study by uh, a colleague called Ian Kite, and he uh, was working in the Southern Levant, and he took sort of ethnographic data and used the surface size of prehistoric sites and the size of communities, uh, ethnographic sort of early, early farmer communities, and sort of made calculations as to how many people were living in a site at one time. Now this is very dangerous in a way because we don't know if an entire site was occupied or whether they were moving around that one site. But we have here the different sites. These are all PPNA sites. Um, and their size, the area sizes, so anything from sort of uh, 0.1 hectare to up to what we've got here, three, three and a half hectares. And we have an estimated population level one, which is based on a, a more conservative sort of reconstruction of, of population numbers and population, uh, 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 more liberal sort of estimate uh, based on 294 inhabitants per square hectare. Uh, and these sort of numbers then sort of fluctuate around 128 or range from 128, 130 to about 419. So, even though it's dangerous to do this, and I realise that, and uh, I wouldn't do it again, but um, I need something to sort of get a grip of to how many people were living at these sites at any one time. And uh, so we get this number, and of course, if we're looking at 130, 140, 150, then we're getting to what you know we know is Dunbar's number, and I think perhaps you're aware of this uh, this uh, term, um, uh, which has been put forward by Dunbar. Um, it's, it reflects the size, or the, the the number of sort of uh, the network, you know, the, the reciprocity, etc. How many relationships you can have with any you know, group of people at any one time, and according to him, 150 is the limit of the, the human brain to keep track of all of those uh, sort of networks, all of those uh, uh, reciprocal sort of activities going on. And of course, when you get over that number, you need mechanisms to take care of it for you. I mean, today we have Facebook and I don't know, Instagram and various things to keep track of people. But at the time, of course, they needed other mechanisms to keep a group together. Um, the thing is, you know, when you reach sizes, community sizes like this, then you're going to have challenges coming in. You know, with sedentism, the population grows, so you're going to have uh, the social cohesion going to be suffering because of that. Um, you're going to have problems with sort of resources because they're going to be fighting over, possibly fighting over resources. There's going to be people collecting more wealth, surplus. So you're going to have sort of hierarchization coming in. All of these things are happening at this time. 
through centralization um, and, and the growth of population, um, all of this is happening. And, you know, it's very strange. I mean, I've looked into this in, in more detail. We have really no evidence for conflict at this time. Um, and, and really the evidence for sort of surplus accumulation and hierarchization is it's there, it's, it's, it's incipient but it's not full-blown, as in, in later periods. So something was being, was, was being used to counter these, uh, these challenges, and I think that cites like a Becky Tepper. Um, and you know, these are communal building projects. I mean, it couldn't have been accomplished in any other way. But it's more than that. And this is why I say they're not just temples. I mean, look at this. I mean, we've got a, a round over ground plan, and we have these two central T-pillars in the middle. And we know that these T-pillars are human representations. So, you know, in a sense, we have these wonderful carved, you know, five and a half meter teepers. This is a carved uh, platform the, 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 and the, the teeper in it, a carved with a smooth floor. And we have here, you can see, um, they're stylized depictions of human beings. The top of the tee is the head and the shaft is the body. So what we have here is a belt. You can see a loincloth made of fox fur. Uh, you have the hands resting on the stomach. And if you look at the sides, you have the, the in low relief, you have the, uh, the arm coming down, the elbow and the forearm. So these are, are really human depictions. And not only that, they're individuals, at least in the case of these two central pillars. I mean, they both look the same. There are two of these, obviously, two central pillars. But for example, they have different necklaces. This one um, here has uh, an H sort of symbol, what I always refer to as a donut and a, a crescent. The other one has the cranium, uh, the, uh, the, the, the skull of an uh, aurochs. So the people that constructed these buildings and put up these tea pillars knew exactly who they were depicting. But they knew these characters, they were either ancestors, we'll come to that in a moment, or mythological beings, but they knew exactly who they were depicting. And of course, you know, the whole setting would have been quite different then. I mentioned that these buildings were roofed over, they would have been going into these buildings, it would have been quite dark, um, they would have been using torches, for example. Um, and, for example, and, and here we have evidence also when this was excavated, um, there was a discovery of a, of a fox uh, tail in anatomic uh, position. So we also think that the, the pillars were being adorned, they're being dressed, there was a colour being used. So it, uh, quite, you know, not as grey as it is today, but a very, very, I think you know, if they were using drugs, which they probably were, and, and alcohol, which might be the case, um, we have evidence possibly for, for alcohol production, beer production. They were probably getting quite, um, well, we have a <laughs> going down here. But I think it would have been part of a ritual that was going on. Um, but more importantly, it's a narrative. And the narrative aspect you can see on the other pillars, for example. These are two pillars. This one is from building, or these two are from building C. Um, you have here uh, three birds, four, but one, two, three, four, five birds against sort of a net sort of backdrop. You have uh, a wild boar at the bottom here, probably a fox coming in here as well. Um, and then on the right hand side, you have a high relief. These are quite not common but frequent. Um, let's see if we can see that close up. Here we have a close up of this, this uh, high relief. I mean, the craftsmanship is quite astounding. I mean, you have the whiskers here, you have the teeth, the eyes, the claws coming in. Even the rib cage is depicted. So these were not sort of beginners. They knew what they were doing and they knew what they were depicting. And this one's strange enough, it has a, a wild boy in lowly at the bottom. So perhaps we're seeing here a hunting depiction uh, going on. This is a, uh, a predator, probably a, a leopard, um, waiting to pounce, perhaps on this sort of a wild boar waiting beneath. It gets even more detailed. We have other pillars which really do tell stories, really do tell narratives. This one in building H, 356, is as full of, of wild animals. Um, and at the edge of one is the border of the next, so they go into one another, they merge into one another. So we have here, we have uh, leopards, we have snakes, uh, we, have, uh, 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 we have here, we have cranes at the bottom, and the people, were, the, the artists, they were, I say artists, they were playing with the imagery. Because if you look here, these cranes, these water birds, they're standing in the waves. But if you look closely, the waves have heads, they're snakes. And this is something they're really playing with the imagery. Um, on the right-hand side, we have, you know, Various animals. We have scorpion here. Is it bottom? We have a bird. We have uh, a vulture here with a spear on its on its wing, uh, balanced. Uh, <laughs> the vulture has a very strange sort of pot belly and uh, strange legs. We have a chick, possibly on the right hand side, a snake, and these very strange H or I symbols that are quite frequent, especially in building D, but we don't know what they mean. And the so-called handbags at the top. 
um, which we think could be depictions of the buildings themselves, the roof buildings. So, I mean, this is not just a collection of animals who were living in the landscape at the time of Gebekli Tepe 11,000 years ago, which are most which are now extinct. But they are showing a narrative, a story. Uh, and I always say it's perhaps a bit like, you know, if we had a pillar today and we had a wolf, a little girl in a red cape, we'd say, right, little red riding hood. I think for them it was exactly the same. They went to these pillars, saw these images, and knew exactly which story was being uh, transmitted. Um, and of course, these stories could be very old indeed, because we know, you know, if we look at uh, uh, prehistoric communities and also more recent uh, traditional communities, a lot of these stories were passed on orally, uh, oral narratives. And I think the most, and this is one of the most important things about Quebec and besides the architecture, is that for the first time, these people are putting in stone these narratives which could date back right into the Paleolithic period. So a very, very impressive piece of uh, work, art, for, for everyone, for the, for the world, in fact. Which is why, of course, we're in the World Heritage Site. So. <coughs> Right, uh, and also I can point out one of the very few human depictions on the pillar, I mean the, the tea pillar itself is a human depiction, um, but down here at the bottom we have this, this guy here, he's missing his head, it's always been uh, proposed this circle at the top here on the, on the bird's wing, on the barge's wing, could be the head of this guy down here, but he's missing his head, so his arm up, and he has a phallus. And phalli are very, you know, they can say they are omnipresent at, at Gebeti Tepe, the, the male symbolism, the penises, the phalli, phalli are a very dominant motif um, uh, at the site, on the, on the pillars, on the sculptures. Um, and this has also been interpreted as being something to do with sort of the, well, what do I say, male dominance, but the, the, the sort of hunter culture, the hunter sort of traditions. Um, here again, a few examples um, of wild boar. We have at the top here, we've seen this one already. And here, this one was actually turned on its head to depict a dead pig, and it's almost had a pig, it's something to pop there. So, um, a very, I mean, there's also the consideration that, you know, why do we have no predecessors of this, of this stuff? I mean, well, it just came out of nowhere. 9,500 BC, all of a sudden they started building these wonderful tea pillars and buildings with these very impressive carvings. I mean, perhaps they were, built, they were doing it in wood first. Perhaps they were, you know, they did, perhaps I mean, we don't have any wood preservation, but perhaps the woodwork was even more impressive than the stonework, and probably even, probably even more so. so. <coughs> So we've seen that, I say common, and it's these narratives which were keeping the community together. Everyone shared this narrative, they knew who was depicted here, we have the communal sort of layout of the buildings, so not just sort of temples, I don't want to say temples, not, they were, they were ritual places, but they were social hubs, and of course we can't, we don't, we can't know who was allowed in these buildings, whether it was reserved for certain parts of the community, of the community, or whether uh, all of the community could go in. But uh, whatever the case was, uh, these buildings were emphasizing this communal sort of activity uh, and the common uh, narratives and also probably the common ancestry. Uh, and talking about ancestry, of course, we can then come to the human bones that we have at the site. Um, the human bones uh, have been taken or were recovered from the fill of these monumental buildings when they were excavated. Um, it's not a great deal of material, it's mainly sort of animal fauna, mainly gazelle, aurochs, <coughs> wild boar. But we have a few uh, animal, uh, human bones, and among these human bones, a lot of them are skull, human skull. And what is important to know is that this period, the whole of the sort of PPNA and uh, early to middle PPNB, this was a period where the human skull, the human head, played a very, very important role. Um, whether you go to the southern Levant, the northern Levant, or now into southeast Anatolia, uh, southeast Turkey, you see um, that the head was given a very important uh, status. It had a very important status. Uh, what happened was people, or certain individuals, perhaps well, probably not everyone, but certain individuals were buried when they died, usually not in, in, in graveyards like today, but it, or whatever, but beneath the floors of the houses or next to the houses. And at some point, not long after, they went back in and they exhumed the skull. So they dug a hole and took away the skull. So you have to sort of you find uh, sort of skeletons missing the skull. The skulls were extracted, and of course, because the decay hadn't, you know, it's, a bit, it's not, you know, just had a bit of a problem, we'll have a bit of later on, but um, they weren't properly decomposed, and they used flint tools to scrape away the rest of the hair and the flesh that was attached to the skulls. And that's what, where these scratch marks come from. So they're using flint tools to clean the skulls. 
And uh, in new studies, um, we have even indications of deep grooves and also small holes. Now, uh, these small holes have often been interpreted as trepanation, so very early forms of surgery to let out the, the, I don't know, the, the evil ghost, whatever it is that's causing the illness. But in this case, this is not trepanation. We think it's too small for trepanation. But it's probably it's a drill hole. And why is it a drill hole? Because these skulls were being displayed. Why else would you extract a skull from uh, a, a burial if you weren't you know, going to do something with it? Um, and of course, we have the plastic skulls from other sites in the Levant. We don't have plastic skulls from Gobekli Tepe yet. I say yet, they could come. Um, but what we do have are these deep grooves and the holes. And the deep grooves, of course, they, we have pieces, uh, the groove comes down here, the front of the, of the face, the skull, and also under the chin. Um, so, of course, we all know that, I didn't know actually beforehand, but uh, if you have a skull and uh, there's nothing holding it together, the bottom jaw drops off. So, uh, we're using a string, a cord, uh, which is sort of aligned using these grooves so it can slip um, to hold the skull together. Then we have the drill holes at the top, and these things will probably be sort of displayed, uh, you know, hung up uh, either in the monumental buildings or elsewhere in the houses, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, they're the ancestors. There was a seat of knowledge. You know, the human head was the place where people had their, their spirit, their knowledge, and that is what they're probably trying to preserve. And these ancestors, these I mean, I think in the course of time, these ancestors became mythical. And these tea pillars that we see without the, the human face depictions, I think they're probably mythical, mythological ancestors. Um, but I wouldn't go as far as to call them gods yet. I think if Gobekli Tepe had not been abandoned, perhaps give it, you know, a few hundred years, perhaps they would have turned into deities, into gods, and we would have had some sort of religion taking off. But at the moment, um, you know, religion, temples, is not on the cards. I mean, for religion and for temples, you need a temple economy, you need priests, what's even writing. Um, and all of this we don't have until the Bronze Age, and three or four thousand years later. After Gobekli Tepe, these monumental buildings disappear entirely and don't come back until then. And as you probably saw at Chattahuyuk, uh, uh, Ian probably told you that the, the shrine moves into the house, into the cellars or into the buildings themselves, into the, into the domestic sphere. Um, previously, it was separate. But nevertheless, you know, the rituals, the beliefs, everything every day was really strongly intertwined with everyday life. So, um, uh, very important uh, to note that uh, you know, the ancestors were probably the, the uh, driving power, you could say, of, of, this, uh, of this site. Uh, here again, we have a, a sculpture here. I mean, it's not very clear. I've never actually seen this uh, myself. I think it's somewhere in the museum now. Um, but it's called the Gift Bearer. And according to the literature, um, Klaus obviously had it in his hand, and he said, what we have here is a human figure, and actually the arms at the front, like this, holding a human skull. Um, it's not very clear from this photograph, and I haven't seen so, uh, this object. And of course we have also the depiction of the man with the human, lacking the, the skull also on the pillar. So um, this is what we now take as evidence for skull cut um, at Ibekita. And it's also visible in the statuary because you know we have these uh, statues that uh, we discover fragments thereof um, in the buildings, and generally what we're finding is just the heads or perhaps one or two torso. Um, a few years back in 2015, we had this uh, one come out over here where we actually found both pieces and they, we did a refit. But what was happening here? These these statues. Um, it appears before they were sort of thrown away, before they were deposited, they too were being decapitated. So they, had sort of, they were really obsessed with this sort of knocking off the heads um, and, and removing the heads of, of not only humans, but also of, of human depictions and statues. Uh, and at this point, I can also sort of give you one of the most recent discoveries, which we're very happy about for many, many years. I mean, Klaus was always uh, uh, quite uh, convinced that the site was very much li was, was linked to death, to a sort of rich death rituals and he never found any human burials. Um, we were asked to excavate a drainage channel for the new shelf that was being built in the main excavation area. So we had a trench coming down to the south here. You can see here, it would have been to the south. Um, that was back in 2017. So we have this channel coming down for the drainage pipe, and at the bottom we have tanks. This actually hasn't been completed yet. We're going to go back and finish this this year. Um, but uh, in the center of this, in this, this uh, sort of box here, we had, lo and behold, our first burial, which we weren't expecting, um, but out it came. And, you know, this um, 
was a fir is a first. Uh, we're very happy, of course, to have this. Uh, the, uh, it's actually a very small area that we're looking at here, but we're actually within a rectangular building. Uh, so it's early BGMB, um, and we have a, a sort of it's a multi phase building. We have at least two floors. Uh, the top floor is here, there's a floor underneath upon which the grey the, the bodies were laid. Um, so they actually made a hole in, in, in the, third, the upper uh, floor, laid the bodies in, and then filled it up again. The, the, there are actually three individuals in this grave, they're actually disturbed, uh, and they still have their skulls. Um, but you can see here that the, the, the bones are still more or less in, in some sort of articulation here. Um, but they're pushed to the side, we have not really any grave gifts. There are two or three large uh, flint blades. Um, but the, this came out in 2017, uh, we haven't finished the analysis yet. Um, and it needs publishing, obviously. Um, but three individuals, um, one adult, one a juvenile, and I think a, a child. So I, I, I mean, the, the results are, are just fresh. Um, but uh, Julia, our anthropologist, was happy because, of course, in spite of all the male symbolism we have at the site, she was very pleased to announce that the adult in here is a female. Um, and it's also quite characteristic of domestic as well, because, of course, a buried up many floors. So another indication that we're dealing with a domestic setting. Um, yeah, I mentioned the beer earlier on, um, uh, but this is something that I'm still not quite convinced of as yet. Um, we have these sort of vats here, which could have been uh, used. Uh, well, there, there were analyses were done of of uh, the sediment taken from from these, and a couple came back positive for fermentation which was taken then as an indication that the people were actually brewing beer. It could have been incidental. Um, I think we need more evidence for that. It's brought into sort of relation to the, the backfilling, which I have, think didn't happen, uh, sort of celebrations, uh, building uh, monuments and attracting people to the site. But I think that's something we need to discuss in more detail, perhaps even in relation to funerary uh, traditions. Um, but what I want to say here, um, before we go on, um, is back to the context. and. I say, we've been talking a lot about Gobekli Tepe now, but we've forgotten the other sites again, because we always do this, because Gobekli Tepe is so sort of amazing, it's so sort of all these wonderful results, we forget to look elsewhere. Um, Gobekli Tepe is not the only tea pillar site in the region. Uh, we of course have Nivali Chori, which was excavated uh, by Hart Monday, and, and now flooded underneath the waters of the Aperture Reservoir. Uh, but we have even more sites known from uh, surface uh, survey work. Uh, my colleague, Bahatin Chemik, has been doing a lot of survey work uh, in and around Ulfa. Um, we know there's probably a tipula site uh, in Ulfa itself, not far from Badapuga, uh, in the center of the city. We have other sites like Kalahan, Hamzan Tepe, uh, Sefer Tepe, all in these mountainous sort of regions uh, around the uh, Haran Plain. And this is not, this is incomplete. I mean, since this, is, this map was done, uh, I think Bartin has got uh, at least a dozen more tipula sites known from surface uh, finds. Um, and he's now excavating uh, a site in the Tectic de Lalle, um, called Halle Um and he uh, has been working there for the past two years and also has rectangular architecture and tea pillars um, now in his, his, his trenches. So it's, it's very exciting. Gobekli Tepe was not the only tea pillar site. It was, of course, one of the biggest, um, comparable in size also to Callahan, which um, um, possibly we'll see some results coming from in, in the future. Um, but the symbolism, okay, we have other sites in northern Syria, Muridet, Sheikh Hassan, Jebel Ahmad, Tekel Amel, and also further east in the Tigris region, Kertek, Tepe, Halan, Sheni, Chayun, they all have very similar sort of symbolism. Uh, they don't have the tea pillars, some of the buildings do have pillars, but not tea shaped, um, but the symbolism is very similar. So, and this is one of the reasons that uh, Klaus referred to the area as a cultic community. These people were in touch, they knew about one another. Um, but for some reason, the T pillar phenomenon was restricted, limited to around Shamawatha. So, I say future work will, you know, we need more work to understand this whole network of what was going on. Here's a picture of Nevali Choi. I didn't want to, uh, I mean, I need to show you that. I mean, this is a rectangular building again. I was talking earlier about the buildings inside buildings. Here again, we have that. We have an outer building and a younger building inside. Um, and this building, before the site was flooded, um, Hartmann had the whole of this so-called cult building taken away stone by stone. 
And I'm, I was really impressed when uh, just a couple of years back the new Shannon of Museum opened, uh, the biggest, newest, uh, all the superlatives uh, uh, museum in Turkey. And this building was reconstructed stone for stone inside the museum. So it's very much, it's very much, it's worth seeing. And that was done by a colleague called Murat Murat Akman, who was actually at the excavation himself with Haldman. Um, and he actually put the thing back together in the museum. So it's really uh, fantastic. Um, yeah, we're now going to come to, to building A, I wanted to show you briefly, because of course these, this symbolism <coughs> wasn't restricted to these sites and this time, but I think it continued for millennia afterwards. And I want to show you a pillar from uh, Building H. This is Building H itself. It's partially excavated in the northwest uh, uh, hollow, northwest depression. We have here the central pillar, which is poking out. The second hasn't been discovered yet. We have the outer wall here. We have a wall on the other side. And we have uh, T pillars uh, around about. And this is the aerial view. So here's the, the building itself here. And you can see it there on the stone plan a bit easier. And we have here this pillar. Pillar 66 in the top hand corner, you can see it. It's this one below this stone here, before it was excavated. Uh, top left hand corner. There we go. And we have this wonderful sort of carving. I mean, it's not high quality, but what you can see here is an aurochs. Um, its tongue hanging out, its legs are buckled, it's dying. It's been hunted probably. And you can perhaps see these lines sort of sticking out of it. There could be spear depictions. Mm -hmm. There's a smaller animal, a smaller one below it on the right, perhaps a smaller animal, perhaps a baby, a calf, or perhaps it's we're seeing some sort of uh, spatial sort of, you know, in the background, foreground sort of thing. But this thing, obviously, it's, it's dying, it's, it's in its death flows. Um, but if we go to Chattanooga, which is, you know, 6,500 BC, um, so really 3,000 years, 2,000 years later, what do we get? We get this, you see. This, the bull baiting, the, 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 the role of the aurochs, the Bucrania are still a very dominant feature um, of the late Neolithic. So we're, we're now right over here. Yeah? So it seems that bull baiting and the, and the, the cult uh, and beliefs around the aurochs were still omnipresent so many uh, years later. And there are so many interesting things about this stone. I, mean, I didn't see this until later when this photo was then, you know, we looked at it more closely. But you can see the zigzag coming out of his eye. And there are various other things like overlays and there's the bird up here as well. So um, if you look at it in the white light, you can see uh, many different things uh, on the stone. And this is also one of the stones, uh, a very unusual stone. We have, not in every building, but in H, in D, C and B, we have these uh, stones that are sort of, uh, sort of broadside on, not sort of narrow side on looking in, but broadside on, and they have a big hole in. We often refer to them as the washing machines, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and we don't know why, why they were like this, but they mainly have a very dominant position in the building, perhaps between the two pillars as you go in. So maybe they were used for putting something inside uh, deposits. Now I want to come to, I don't know how much time I have left, I'm just trying. Five minutes or something like that? Five minutes? Okay. <laughs> Take longer if you need it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. I just get carried away. Um, I want to come to the domestic bit because this is the most, perhaps one of the most important insights we have now because if we look down here, I want to take you to this trench down here, which is a sondage for the, for the roof that came in. Um, so we have to go right down to the, the, uh, the bedrock. So here it is again. And this is what we found. I mean, this is quite remarkable. We have domestic structures, comparable to domestic structures we know from other sites of the period. For example, in northern Syria, we have this agglomerative building, uh, sort of honeycomb sort of building. Uh, uh, we have here a multi-phase structure with Latin T pillars. We have here, most importantly, an activity zone with a hearth, uh, with a fireplace. And then we have the finds that go with it. We have evidence of bee production. We have evidence for bone tools, which were not so frequent before, but in this area were very, uh, very high frequency. And you know, this is something um, that is it's smells of domestic. And then of course, just recently, and this is a comparative uh, comparisons here, for example, from Kirtik Tepe um, in the Tigris region, and from Hassan Cave um, as well, uh, Japanese, ex Japanese Dutch excavation. So we can see uh, the similarities. Uh, these, are, these are definitely domestic sites. So we have them now also 
that's a good locally temper, right on the bedrock, so probably the earliest phase. They're round, they're comparable to other PPNA sites. So really from the earliest phases of, 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 of the site, we have what appear to be domestic structures at the Beckley Temple. Um, and of course, one of the questions was, and my class always said, no, no domestic structure, where's the water coming from? Well, water um, is a problem. He said the nearest water sources were like, you know, uh, three, four, five kilometers away, uh, downhill and uphill again. But we have these systems um, here, and uh, uh, carved systems, carved channels, of course he knew about these, but uh, we're now seeing them in a, in a different light because now we know that they are actually pre-pottery in a different date because we have excavated one of these and they have inside, we have human bones <coughs> which had scratch marks, which were deposited, um, which had uh, you know, all the signs of being a PPN uh, secondary burial. So, and which then dates for us the, the, uh, at least that one system. But if we then project it onto the others, this is probably a, a network, a prehistoric, a Neolithic, water gathering network, or harvesting the rainwater. This is a, another technology um, which is new. Uh, we have other examples from the Southern Levant a bit later, PPNB period. But if this is PPNA, then it's perhaps the earliest. Uh, this is just a map showing drainage. So a lot of these systems, these pink dots are on the west-hand side where the water runs down uh, from the site, the site's over here in the east. Um, and then uh, to reinforce that sort of uh, domestic uh, buildings that we had in, in, in the one trench that I just showed you, we had, which actually is located just at the top of this mound, we did another drainage channel for the new second new shelter, which involved us doing a deep trench 40 meters in length uh, down the western side of the slope. Uh, at the beginning we found nothing but slope wash, but then, lo and behold, we had structures. And these structures mirrored the ones that we had at the top of the mound. So on the, on the surface of the, of, the, of the bedrock. So what we have here are very small structures, round structures with plaster, with stone uh, uh, casing, as it were, um, more or less on top of the bedrock. Uh, there's a, like a rubber foundation to sort of even things off, and I put these things in. And here we have at least eight structures. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to excavate this, because we have a very sort of limited view. But we think we have at least eight buildings here, multi-phase, but also with, you know, with uh, um, uh, rubbish deposits, uh, plus even hearts, etc. go on here. So it's uh, a most important uh, new discovery. This is the last slide. This is what we want to close with. This is a new reconstruction uh, that we want to show of the site. And it's actually now uh, to be seen at the visitor centre um, at Quebecki Tepper. This was done in cooperation with Dorsch for their new, uh, because they were sponsoring, or are still sponsoring the, the information centre uh, outside the site. So there's a big display, there's a, like a 180 degree cinema experience, and this is one of the information boards. And it shows you how we think the site would have looked now. We have the rectangular architecture, which we now know, what we know is PPMB, but we also now know that the buildings and the monumental buildings themselves from new radiocarbon data were long lived and probably extended into this PPMB period. That's looking at uh, two, three, four, five hundred year old buildings, multi-phase, which were roofed over, perhaps with access through the roof, um, this one's been left open just for you know, display purposes. But we have the round, the rectangular, and we have the buildings in front. So it's a working settlement. People were living here. These were not temples, they were monumental buildings, they were filling multi functions, various functions, but mainly they were social sort of uh, hubs. Um, they were keeping the group together, they were sort of reinforcing narratives and their beliefs. <coughs> probably based around ancestry. So I think that's about all to say for now, and I'll be happy to answer some questions. Thank you very much for that extraordinarily rich and insightful and, and yeah, well. beautiful visual presentation, which we've Was I too long? Sorry. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> Perfectly timed. Good. So, so thank you so much. Now, who would like to ask a question about speaker? One here, please. Thank you. That, that's a wonderful poem. He's really well put. Excellent. Um, I'm intrigued about the population because you're, you're saying that, um, that this is all pre-agricultural. Mm -hmm. And um, um, would you consider that the population of the, of the area would have been permanent? And if so, would they, I mean, presumably they would have been hunter-gatherers as mm -hmm. such. 
although a small minority may have been, a very small minority may have been allocated to certain uses, but the majority would be hunter gatherers. Yeah. Would there be enough um, facility in the area to support that kind of population? Hunter -gatherer yeah, population? I mean, the, the resources in the area is something that we are hoping to hear more from, from the geographers. Mm. In the course of time, and of course, uh, the environment we, we know already would have been quite different than today. I mean, today it's quite. It'd be a lot, it'd be a lot yeah, better, and it's mm. all the goat herds going around, it's yeah. being barren at the moment. Mm. Of course, a lot of, because of the uh, irrigation now, we have a lot of farming. I mean, uh, I think they have all year agriculture and, and cotton mm. uh, uh, down in, in Wolfer. Um But at the time, it would have been sort of a, 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 sort of a woodland landscape, we've mm. had oak, um, wild pistachio, almond, um, sort of loose sort of woodland. Uh, with uh, herds of gazelle, um, they were the most important uh, mm. meat source for the people at the time. Uh, with the odd sort of aurochs and wild boar, so there was very wet areas as well. We have cray, we have wet for uh, sort of uh, birds, you know, wetland birds as well. So I think um, we have to imagine it as quite a, uh, a very, and I hate to say it, but no, I'm not going to say it, but you know, it's been compared to the Garden See. of Eden. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not going to say that again, um, because of course that's taking it in that entirely wrong direction. Um, but it would have been a very, I think resources would not have been a problem. Of course, as the population sort of increased, they would have been using a lot of wood probably for, for construction in, purposes. In, in that kind of representation you have there, mm. what, would the popula what would you estimate the population? Oh, I mean, if I, if I, I, I did, four figures you know, the three table figures. I did, yeah, if the table I did for the other sites, mm. I didn't put Quebec a bit in there, because it's like nine hectares and it's, uh, it would have, mm. as you say, four mm. figures, and mm. that just doesn't yeah. seem very realistic. Mm. Um, but we can't rule it out. I mean, we have a lot of excavation, well, there's a lot of area unexcavated. I think a lot of the slopes would have been covered with, with uh, buildings. I mean, we could be looking, I mean, in the, in the southern Levant, they often speak of a sort of late PPMB sites or middle PPMB, late PPMB sites as being mega sites. And I'm just wondering whether we're seeing a uh, first mega site. I, I, didn't, I didn't say that <laughs> but, uh, for the camera. Um, but, you know, we, we have to keep that in consideration. But the thing is, with these prehistoric sites, um, we know that from other sites like uh, Transavia Abiyad in northern Syria and Balik, uh, or, or even Chatahuyu, there's a lot of moving around going on. Mm -hmm. So not the entire mound would have been set, uh, perhaps was, was settled at once, but perhaps they were sort of on the eastern side for a decade and then went to the western side, then perhaps the family broke off and went to the northern side. So perhaps wasn't all uh, contemporaneous. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's why it's problematic doing these reconstructions. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, you know, a side, a side of Quebec to 1500 years, 1500 years is also a long time. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very, very mm -hmm. careful, I think, with our estimations. But we have to start somewhere, I mm -hmm. suppose. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I think it would have been quite a considerable site. Mm -hmm. um, I met this um, professor um, uh, from Cagliari in Sardinia, and he was x raying. He, he's got this machine that he can x ray. The terrain, and then he could the see. The geo radar. The yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you could see much bigger areas. That's there, right. You? I mean, we have we have plans. We've had some done, um, mm. but of course, technology improves in mm. the course. I mean, that's quite a while. It's like five, six years ago now, and in that sort of time, the techniques improve and the technology improves. And I think we could do some more. But the thing is, um, sometimes there are problems with the with the, with the terrain. Um, also, we have a lot of olive trees in the way. Um, <coughs> things that sort of hamper that sort of thing, but I think we're going to try again in the near future to get some more, or at least new uh, georadar, um, electromagnetic, whatever it is done, um, and also in areas that haven't been covered yet. Mm -hmm. So that would be a help, yeah. I uh, wonder how, uh, is the popularity affecting the excavation uh, works? Because I know that years ago, before the uh, heritage announcement, uh, it has been less known by ordinary people, local and foreign tourists. Mm -hmm. Now, curios curiosity is rising, interest and attention mm -hmm. is rising, officials are there, new, yeah. new young academicians are there, yeah. we saw the photographs, how they are uh, very interested in mm -hmm. the works. Uh, I'm not sure that the, uh, uh, from your angle it was or it's not a very good thing. Um. I enjoy my work. <laughs> uh, it's true. I mean, um, of course, I'm first and foremost an archaeologist, and I like doing my research. But if I'm honest, in the past two years, I haven't done much research. Um, of course, my colleagues have, have been doing that uh, as well. You know, they've been doing their, their research. I try and keep the, their facts clear as best I can. But of course, we do have a lot of commitments. We have been advising, um, for example, the for the New Information Centre. Uh, we do provide uh, sort of. Uh, Obviously, when, when we have guests, distinguished guests to the site, uh, we're also there to provide that support. 
Um, I mean, it's a, when I studied archaeology, I didn't think I would be doing this sort of thing. I mean, uh, I studied archaeology, I was doing my studies, I've never learned anything about uh, running a, a project, a you know, multi-million euro project, I never learned anything about um, uh, diplomacy or, or uh, <laughs> taking care of distinguished guests, I never learned anything about all of this stuff, and, and site management and heritage and UNESCO, I mean, all of this is new. Um, but it's part of the modern archaeologist world, and it's something that we have to sort of get come to terms with. And I think the academic sort of side of things, universities have to start dealing with that, I think. And there are courses that are available for, for but they're specialist areas as well. Um, I'm with a jack of all trades at the moment, but uh, of course our focus is the academic side of things. But we cannot, as I said in my uh, introduction, we have to think of these three sort of columns. We have to think of, of uh, not only our academic uh, desires, what we want to find out, but also the, the conservation, the heritage protection, and also the presentation, because of course the site is a big economic factor uh, now. Um, I think all the drawings and figures are male in Gebetli Tebe. As far as I know, only one uh, drawing we is have one female. female. Yeah. It's clearly and female. She, yes, and giving birth, I think. Possibly. Yeah, sure. yes, possibly. Yeah. So, what's your opinion about that? I mean, not all of the depictions do have phalli. Um, a lot of them do, but some of them, the animals have just no genitalia. I mean, they could be female. Um, right. I mean, there's no. I mean, we do have. Uh, I mean, the, 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 I have to tell one, one little anecdote. We have, we have uh, when we're excavating in the northwest uh, area for the, the shelter project, we have a deep sounding um, in one area, and we had the biggest phallus so far to be excavated. And I'm not lying, it was like this. And uh, our workmen had a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the pictures go from very small, small images to very large. Uh, so it's a very dominant factor, uh, male, maleness. Um, but I really don't want to rule out that female was equally as important, although not, some, not in the symbol, not in the, in the, in the depictions and the imagery. Um, but I think we do have that one depiction that you're speaking about, and of course we have the, the, the images where we have no clear. Uh, sex uh, given. So uh, I don't think you can rule out entirely that we're missing the females. At the beginning of the PPNA, or maybe even mm. a little before in the period, I think it was often referred to as the Younger Dryas, yes. following the mini ice age. Mm. What were the climate conditions like then? Do we know? Was it much cooler than now? Yeah, yeah I mean, I rain? Have, no, I mean, I think as far as I understand, <coughs> the Younger Dryas would have been drier and cooler. Um, and then the wet wet period will come with the early Holocene. Um, so it, it's this thing we're lacking local proxies, and pa the paleoclimate of the region is, is very local. Um, we have like uh, larger like, proxies, like as I was saying, Lake Van, or we have Stereofem somewhere that, that can give a more regional picture. But especially uh, in, in this part of the world, we do have a lot of local uh, climate. Well, there is a view of that it followed very quickly within 10, 15 years. It was very years. abrupt. Yeah, yeah. It was a very abrupt mm. uh, thing. But I mean, if you look at reforestation, that took a good, a good while to actually mm. then occur. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was quick in terms of, of world sort of yeah. you know, geological history, but yeah. uh, but it wasn't sort of. But uh, I, I, you know, it would have been. I think within a couple of generations. I think mm. because it's so dramatic. It would have become, uh, yeah. but this reforestation, etc., would have taken a bit longer, yes. I think, to actually yes. be completed. And um, grain production, where, when did that really take off? Um, more, I mean, we have the people at Quebec at this time at Paleolithic PPNA were actually harvesting wild grain. And of course, uh, that's prerequisite for the domestication process. Um, but it's not until the early PPMB that we have what we term morphologically domesticated. So we actually can see on the grain itself that it's a domesticated form. But it takes a while for that obviously to develop. So this PPNA period we have to see as an experimental period. And it wasn't until the early PPMB that we then have the morphologically domesticated sort of forms that we can see and identify as such. So I would say it was a long process. And it wasn't, the point wasn't even linear. It was probably like, you know, um, more like that, yeah. So that's one generation did a bit more, and the other one forgot something, and then it, they started back at the beginning. Uh, but it was a long, you know, over over a good you know thousand years um, that we're talking about until that actually came out, you know, a bit more positive. But it would have started in the end, I think.
What, what, what do you think would have caused the demise of the, of the town? Oh, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this recently, and I mean, the most obvious thing would be to say, okay, they went, the, the domesticated crops came in, the animals came in, and the, the, the landscape where they were up in the, in the mountains wasn't, or in the hills, just wasn't what they needed. Mm. They went down into the plain. And we see that. I mean, there are later sites, late PPMD sites like those. Have you been climate related? Um, you know, I don't like to say it's just climate because that would be sort of dangerous. That would be sort of monocausal, sort of um, and determinist, and what have you. Um, I did my PhD on, on paleoclimate uh, and uh, cultural interaction, and I got a lot of uh, stick for that. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very careful with the, with the monocausality discussion. So I would say it's a mixture of both. I think climate always played a role, but I think we have to consider the cultural implications and the cultural development at the time. I mean, if these communities were growing to this extent, they would have needed more space. Perhaps resources weren't as you know, forthcoming in that. Uh, the, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm still thinking, I'm just wondering, you know, these tea, this tea pillar phenomenon, where did it come from? And I'm still, and if we really think that the, the, the site went on into, say, the middle PPMB, if it's so long lived, that would have been a time when we would expect to see morphologically domesticated crops and animals at the site. But we still don't have any, so why not? And I'm starting to think perhaps we're seeing a very, very late conservative hunter gatherer group trying to sort of preserve its old hunting traditions yeah. and the, the new sort of the new, you know, the, the new technologies, the innovations that were going on down in the plain, that was, that was taboo at the site. I, I'm just wondering, this is something I'm playing with at the moment in, in, in my, in my you know, uh, academic kind of work. About 2,000 years later. Uh, what was 2,000? Kalaholic was 2,000 years later, 3,000 yeah. years. I mean, Chattahoe uh, starts about 7,500 BC in the late PPMB. Um, but of course, the, the Chattahoe that we know, these you know, the, the buildings, yeah. and, and that, that was sort of from about 7,000 BC mm. to sort of 6,000. Mm. So that was much later. Um, and things have changed by then. Yeah. Yeah. So, <coughs> sorry about the mono causality again, but we <laughs> talked about the end of the site and the beginning of the site. Yeah. And we talked about the end of the end for climatic yeah. reasons. So, um, but, but given that this is recognised as the world's oldest megalithic structure, well, what, 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 I mean, please, some ideas as to trigger. Could it be something in language or genetics or anything like that? So, what, how did how yeah, did we have very little? Um, we have a few epipaleolithic sites around Bozova, which is west of, of Shamalopa, and, and but very much, very little apart from that. And you know this type of thing, it didn't seem to come from the south. Although we have monumental, or not monumental, we have communal buildings, so-called special buildings, at all of these eleven, at many of the Levantine sites, um, large round structures which would have you know housed or, 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 you know, space for, for <coughs> quite a few people. But nothing like this type of monumentality, and this is something that you know we don't have anywhere else. And for this reason, which I'm not wondering, or we're wondering, whether it actually came from the south, whether it could have come from the south. Perhaps we're looking at a, 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 something coming in from elsewhere. Um, uh, but that's really speculation, and I, I, I really have no answer for that at the moment. Um, I would love to, to know where it came from. But, uh, I mean, there's this wooden sculpture from Siberia that's been sort of compared to uh, the, 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 the depiction in there, the, the human depictions from Galapagos. I mean, Siberia is a long way. You know, so uh, whether we get some northern sort of uh, influence or eastern influence or probably not southern influence, probably not even western, but yeah. it's so yeah. With all these influences, things do start, I guess, and yeah. I, I guess that I think that the, <coughs> the authorities in in Shandy is this is the the start of a certain kind of history. yeah. I mean, it's it's, it's so zero it's point of in time. Yes, exactly. Uh, actually, so, uh, yes. So which I don't actually. Well, it's, it's okay. <laughs> I won't say anything. <laughs> I've said enough. Yeah. It's, it's a request rather than a question. Oh. But it's, um, as it becomes a heritage site and you get more and more tourists and you can create more facilities mm -hmm. more, when we were there, I think about six years ago, what I remember apart from the site itself was the extraordinary amount of work flint. Yes. There. Yeah. Are you going to maintain that as part of the visitor experience? Because it was quite extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, if you have like a field full of work flint and the tourists walk through it, it's going to decrease in number from day to day. I understand that. <laughs> so, just 
but Hogan, it was the most extraordinary thing. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously, yeah, yeah, the thing is, you so. can't, the, the plateau is not accessible to the visitors. Uh, there are no plans to make it access accessible to the visitors for that very reason, because there are so many finds on the surface, so much flint, uh, ground stone tools. You just walk across it, you can pick up cores, you know, bipolar cores, the book, the PKB, etc. You can pick up arrowheads occasionally. Um, uh, really, sometimes even small statues, you know, little figures, that sort of thing. It's all out there, and you know, if we let the people walk across it, then it would be gone within no time. Mm -hmm. um, but there are no. And how would you do that? That's another question, of course. At the moment, the visitors are kept to a, a wooden walkway, um, which leads from the entrance up the main excavation area, and then up to the wish tree at the top of the mound, and then back round again across the, north, the southwest mound, and then out. Um, which I think is, it gives a good overview of the site. Um, but to let them out on the plateau, I think it's, we need a, a very good plan if we're going to do that. And I don't think it's going to happen uh, in the future. As far as I'm yeah. There is more innocent time. Mm -hmm. But you know, special guests get the special treatment to make them on the plateau. <laughs> 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 yeah. Have you any way of estimating the length of time Mm. Involved in constructing oh. the structures. <laughs> um, of course, you know we have to realise that these buildings. Um, now, it probably won't be anything to you, but I always compare it to the Cologne Cathedral um, in Cologne because it was started, but it's never been finished. Um, and I think it's very much the same with these buildings. Actually, a lot of the teepers, or most of the teepers, and, and probably a lot of the stone work and stones, are recycled. Um, they were very big at recycling. They were taking an old, actually building H, um, I haven't let it show it in detail, but there's one a part of the wall where there's a big slot where a teepler would have stood. It appears that they actually pulled it and took it elsewhere to use elsewhere. Building E, which I didn't show, um, is totally clear of superstructure, and we just had to cut the smooth floor and the pedestals. And so, and it didn't stick down the slope because it was never found, I think Charles actually looked for it. So um, they were actually moving stuff around a lot and it wasn't like, you know, I, I'm, it's obvious that there was a plan to the whole thing. I mean, the things are planned as they are. This ground plan is, is not you know, just something that happens. But there was a lot of sort of smaller projects going on over the whole time, I think, um, that we have, we have to imagine. I mean, a lot of, some of the teeplers have turned the wrong way. Others have images that are hidden by wall, which should have been invisible. Um, so um, there was a lot of moving around going on. Um, and that's what makes us think that these buildings were very long lived, apart from the different phases we can see in the walls. So, um, regarding sort of time, that's difficult. Manpower, also difficult because of course small groups can do things as well. Um, and if you're skilled, I mean, I see my you know, the, the guys from the, the workmen who I love dealing in, and they're they're so skilled. And they're, I mean, they are the highest skilled uh, workman I've ever seen because they, they, they can see things in the, in the archaeology or in the excavation before I even see or even my colleagues see them. <laughs> so trained archaeologists are sort of there and the are saying, oh, there's a wall coming there. It's like, no, no, 10 minutes later, there it is. So, you know, they have an eye for it. They've been working at the site for 25 years, some of them. So, um, and they are, you know, if you say, we don't have any machinery at the site as such, you know, we don't have any cranes or whatever to lift things. And if you have a large slab or whatever, it has to be moved. I say, you know, can you move it for us? And it's amazing, you know, how much they can do, how much they can lift and move away with just a group of five, six men. They have that tripod out and they have the rope out and it's gone. And uh, so um, I think these estimates of like, all these sort of comparisons with uh, modern, it, it, these photos I think from the, from the Far East where you have uh, also a negative tradition where you have like hundreds of people pulling at a, at a, you know, at a rope I, I don't think so. I think it was probably small groups of very trained men uh, and women um, which would have been uh, doing this work. Sorry, that was a bit sort of long, long answer, but that's... Uh, um, that's the, the, the public spaces are very, very large for that time. I mean, leaving out how we interpret them. I mean, what parallels can you draw from other, other sites? Other sites? I mean, we have... I mean, there's obviously nothing like this, and, and uh, but there are similar sized buildings, for example, at, at other sites. We look at Wadi Fainan in, in Jordan, um, um, uh, Bill Finlayson site. Uh, they had a very large you know, area. Um, now, I don't know whether that was 
covered by a roof or not, but there, there are examples of large communal areas in these early Neolithic PPM uh, sites. Um, so that doesn't wonder. I mean, it's, it would appear that this period of, of early sedentism um, was really sort of <coughs> a period which saw this sort of incipience of, of bringing a group physically together in that way, in a, you know, in a fixed arena, as it were. I mean, these buildings here, and I forgot to say that, I mean, obviously there are earlier examples of, of for example, the prehistoric cave art in, in France, Spain, Portugal, oh, I'm saying it, et cetera, et cetera. But that was put in a natural sort of context on a cave wall. Mm -hmm. Here, for the first time, people were building the stage for their <coughs> marriages. Mm -hmm. And that's something new at Quebec and Fulton. It's also the same for, for, for the communal buildings. I think probably in, in Wadi Fainan, but also for example in Jabba Ahmar, we have paintings plastered on the plaster of these buildings. They have no teeth, but they have plastered, they're all plastered, um, and they have uh, paintings on them, images, uh, uh, patterns, um, so um, <coughs> even animal depictions. Mm -hmm. So um, these communal spaces that are built is really something special. These, these, this period saw this sort of, these communal arenas where they're actually using them. To, 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 to show their narratives, and that's mm -hmm. something I think must tell us something about these, these uh, people in these communities. They had that need to, to do that. And why was that? And I would say the challenges of the, of the new the transition. Um, you know, the hands on the thing, uh, you know, just standing like that, mm. doesn't it look like a religious? Uh, position of a man? Um, there are other, I mean, they are filming on the, on the stomach. Um, of course, there have been so many comparisons with like Easter Island and various things in Malta, and we can't accept that because that's too far away. And I mean, I know you're not saying that, just you know, for, for the record. Um, but this position, obviously, on the belly has, and we have. For example, the, the figure that I showed earlier on with the, the two parts of the head and the body, he had his arms like this. And I think the arm position, or the position of the hands, means something that we don't understand anymore. I think that, that has some meaning, but we just cannot really you know, interpret it. Um, so I do think this has a meaning. But if we look, uh, for example, at Orphaman, which is this, I didn't show a picture, but it's a, uh, one of the first, or the first monumental sort of statue of a human being, of a man. Um, which is on display in the Orphan Museum, was found uh, in the centre of Orphan, not far from Balutigo. Um, he has his hands like this, but further down, and therefore sort of emphasising the genitalia. Mm. Um, so I don't know whether in the course of time that moved up, whatever, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, the art position in the hand position does have a meaning, but whether it's a religious connotation or whether it means something else. Of course, religion is something I don't want to bring into context with this. I'd say it's more a ritual. Or a, it has some significance. So. Um, to get to those depictions. Uh, can I ask one more mm -hmm. question? You know those uh, drawings, animal uh, things, uh, did you uh, do any uh, work on it compared to uh, hieroglyphs and, uh, you know, million hieroglyphs? Maybe? Yeah, I mean, these things aren't, aren't language. I mean, uh, they're obviously a, s a symbolic sort of language in a way. They are telling a story. Um, but I don't think we're seeing any form of writing at all. And, and <laughs> that is, I would not compare them to, to, to later stuff from Egypt or hieroglyphs, I mean, that's much later anyway. I mean, we have to remember these are hunter gatherers. We are in, not well, that hunter gatherers can't be right, of course they can, but it was too early for that, I haven't made that step yet. Um, but we're in a period 11,000 years ago. Uh, hunter gatherers, sedentary, okay, but all of these innovations that come along, um, you know, uh, even pottery and domestication of animals and, and plants, all of that is probably needed until that step is made to this sort of, uh, say, around the Bronze Age, when we do have like this sort of uh, temple economy coming in, the first sort of monumental temples, um, and, and sort of these sort of Mesopotamian civilizations. Um, and that was something, i say, much later. And when the Bethlehem ceased, when this sort of monumental building and teeth of building and making and carving ceased, um, it disappeared this monumental architecture. I'll say in, in central Turkey, in western Turkey, late in the you don't see this at all. It's gone. It doesn't come back for a long time. I think that is, um, our speaker has been speaking for quite a long time. We should give him a break. Um, and <laughs> express our thanks once more. <laughs>